Hello. Um, sorry for the delay. I promised to start this lecture at uh, 1300, but it took some time. As you know, usually the problems with um, with the technical kind of problems which appear at the last minute. So, um, welcome to the lecture in the module called "Fight Against Corruption." Um, I should tell you that this is a lecture which is um, taught in the module um, uh, at criminal law, um, uh, criminal law department of um, uh, Baku State University. And uh, in a row, this is the fifth lecture which uh, we are uh, which we are teaching. Therefore, you see it in the title. Before I proceed, um, um, before I proceed with the lecture, I would like to um, um, I think I want to um, I want to broadcast from the uh, desktop. Uh, there's a tiny problem which I'm trying to overcome now. Um, just a second. Any problem which I'm trying to overcome now? So I would like to express my acknowledgments to um, Dr. Amir Aliyev, who is a Dean of Law Faculty at Baku State University for, for um, this channel, as well as for her guidance and opinions to the head of the criminal law department of our university, um, um, Dr. Shahla Samadova, and to all the people, all the staff of law department um, and the volunteers from among students who helped to make this lecture possible, and especially to uh, Ms. Firavan Alizada. Uh, and before we start actual the substantial part of our lecture, I would like to call upon all the listeners to um, stay at home, as you see in the, in the lights, in the colors of national flag. I urge you to stay at home um, be optimistic and not to waste your time. This time, uh, this we're going through difficult, hard times uh, affected by um, this coronavirus, but it, it's not the end of the world, I hope. So uh, we might make most of the time that has been allowed to us 
So don't waste your time. Spend it in a useful way. Read more books, follow our lectures, and everything, um, everything will be fine. Um, just my technician informed me that um, there's no way that um, this this um, um, PowerPoint presentation is operating. I'm trying my best. Um, uh, so maybe in the course of this lecture it will appear again, but I will continue anyway. I will continue anyway. Um, so let me tell you about the incrimination of corruption. Before going to this uh, specific topic, I would like to um, give you a broad perspective, the general context in which um, um, in which we are going to um, 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 speak about this problem. This general concept, uh, as you see from the contact, I will speak to you about the legislative approach, about the uh, requirements of international instruments, and certainly the echoing um, um, about the, um, uh, we'll speak about the, uh, provisions of national legislation where it's appropriate and I will share with you the key ideas and concepts. So I'm not going to read out all these provisions of conventions, of international instruments or indeed our legislation. I'm not going to do this because that would be a waste of time. You can do this on your own going into very details. Uh, I see my role, my primary role as guiding you and providing with you with the necessary guidance so that you can on your own explore it in greater details. Um, so um, speaking of the general context, general context, um, when we speak about general context, of course, we mean the general arrangement in the country uh, which has been taken in order to uh, fight against corruption. In order to fight against corruption. And in order to do this, uh, we refer to a wide, wide range of measures and framework established by the government. As I told you in the previous lectures, uh, the government of Azerbaijan, the authorities, they actually took on the approach, uh, the universal and international approach, um, uh, which is um, described in the first and so far the only international um, international approach by the set by the uh, United Nations Convention Against Corruption. So the general uh, context set by the main guiding instrument ANCAC is that in order to fight corruption we're supposed to um, take measures in the following fields uh, that is corruption prevention uh, which covers different aspects of public life indeed the, this is quite ambivalent and you can see that um, I hope in a couple of seconds our presentation will come on to the screen, but it will cover the regulation of uh, civil service, um, for example, the recruitment, uh, the, uh, the disciplining of civil servants and other issues. It covers such issues as financial control and regulation. Um, indeed, it, will, it, will, it also covers many other issues such as ethical conduct and uh, other type of stuff. Next in, in this context is, um, um, is the criminalization of corruption, actually. So um, after the prevention of uh, corruption, after the measures aimed at, uh, uh, at the um, uh, uh, prevention of corruption, uh, it's important to, um, uh, to send a message that any violations in this field, they will be actually uh, dealt with in an appropriate, effective manner. And that appro appropriate, effective manner is 
the actual uh, treating it of it in a um, in the within the realm of the criminal law, i.e., through the application of uh, standards. Of course, criminalization it's not a panacea. It's not a method of treatment of corruption. It is important that the state take on the wide range of measures. Indeed, criminalization must be a kind of the last resort. I mean, uh, the effect of criminalization must be the last resort of, um, of um, uh, treating this issue of corruption. It's also important that countries actually um, conduct international cooperation. They engage themselves in a very effective and intensive international cooperation. And it's also important that um, uh, the results, um, the consequences of corruption, um, which are primarily manifested in the form of um, in the form of the stolen or ill-gotten assets, that these assets are returned, so the corrupt officials can see that the result of their um, that the result of their corruption activities uh, will, will be dealt with in an adequate manner. So when we speak about the general issues, uh, I'm slowly giving up the hope that this will work eventually. I, I also, by, at the same time as I speak to you, I try to, um, uh, to write, to speak to him via other channels of communication and uh, I try to do my best in order to bring this um, um, to bring this PowerPoint presentation uh, because otherwise it would be not useful. I mean, what point is it to look at my face every time and then? So let's hope that it will come up at uh, at any minute. Be optimistic, as I said to you, since we're staying home, uh, we're optimistic and we're not wasting our time. Um, um, so, in the next um, slide of my presentation, which you unfortunately don't see, um, I'm speaking about the general approach. The general approach is that um, there's no single definition of corruption offence. No single definition of corruption offence. Um, Um, the approach which is taken in, uh, in treating the corruption uh, criminal offences is that all the context, concepts, all the terms, um, they must be a kind of, of a kind of wider and um, uh, inclusive interpretation. What I mean by that? Um, imagine that, um, not imagine, but uh, you know that criminal law does not stand for analogy. So whatever is um, reflected in the provisions of the penal legislation, only these norms can be actually applied. And the issue of uh, the criminal liability is a rather strict one. So uh, when um, people can, be only, can only be prosecuted for issues which are, uh, for issues which are uh, reflecting the provisions of the criminal law. In this sense, um, there should be a balance uh, in, in the course of description of uh, criminal offences of corruption in the legislation. And uh, the uh, terms used for incriminating corruption, uh, they must be as wide as possible and inclusive. So they shouldn't allow chance for the perpetrators to escape liability just because as some kind of function which they are implementing in the government or private sector has not been encompassed by the legislation, uh, has not been encompassed by the legislation, or so the, the title of their position, the title of their job was somehow not relevant for the term provided in the penal code. Um, for example, if when we use the term, use, uh, I just put it for myself as an example in the brackets. It's the terminology of temporary. Um, when we say temporary in describing the public official, as I will mention later, uh, we mean 
uh, every renewable office every renewable office and um, in any case when we refer to any specific term in the penal legislation the criminal legislation we shall remember that the list they not shall not be exhaustive because if we refer to specific terms in our legislation which are exhaustive in their in their application in their meaning then we can risk risk to uh, make the big fish uh, escape the net of law enforcement measures against corruption. When we speak about um, uh, uh, my technician has just mentioned to me that there's a chance that the uh, uh, the power presentation is streamlined onto the screen. Um, just a second. Okay, uh, that's great news. I hope you see now this presentation, which unfortunately I cannot see myself, but I hope you can see. Um, so, um, when we speak about this approach, uh, I shall mention one important issue. The offences of corruption, uh, although they existed in our legislation from the earlier times, from the very time, uh, very uh, from the time when our country became independent in 1991, and even before, in the uh, penal uh, legislation of the former Soviet Union. Um, nevertheless, uh, the model which we have in our legislation. It was not the result of some, some kind of the evolution of the provision of our legislation. It happened that um, we adopted this legislation from international instruments. Of course, this was the decision of our government. We decided to accept these norms and we decided to join the international community in these efforts to handle this global problem of corruption but the legislation, the actual content of legislation, it comes from the international instruments. And before coming from international instruments, of course, um, these uh, provisions leave their own life in the legislation of foreign countries, some countries which gave it its origin. So um, when we speak about this legislation um, in our country, we are referring to the international um, experience as well as the experience of foreign countries who first introduced this provision, this kind of provisions. So um, we are referring to international instruments um, such as Criminal Law Convention on Corruption, which has its own monitoring mechanism of Greco. It's an institution of within the Council of Europe. There's also the Civil Law Convention on Corruption, which is not particularly relevant to the subject of our conversation today. And also the United Nations Convention Against Corruption with its own review mechanism, which is called ANCAC IRG International Review Group. The country is also under the review of the other uh, mechanism, which is called Istanbul Action Plan of the Anti-Corruption Network of the OECD. You can actually browse the um, you can actually browse the pages in the internet and see the um, reports relating to Azerbaijan. Oh, that's it! Finally, even I can see it now. Um, even I can see it now. Fantastic! Um, let's first have a look at what kind of offences uh, were. Um, uh, are provided by the uh, United Nations Convention um, Against Corruption. As you see from Article 15 to 19, these are different types of uh, bribery, embezzlement, and trading in influence, as well as abuse of power. Um, also, you can see different types of 
uh, offenses uh, from 20 to 25, articles 20 to 25. Um, these are from range from illicit enrichment, uh, offenses in private office, in private sector, as well as laundering of proceeds of crime and uh, concealment, as well as obstruction of justice. Of course, I'm not planning to cover all these offenses in today's lecture uh, because the incrimination of corruption is divided into several parts. I will be covering these lectures, these issues later on in my further, um, in my further, um, in my further lectures, which are available to the students of my course on my own YouTube channel. Um, for the sake of not advertising it, I'm not mentioning its name, so, um, but I just mentioned that we continue this work with two of my, three of my students, uh, two of uh, whom I can see right now that they've joined this, um, this lecture. Uh, in other international instruments, which I mentioned earlier, it's a criminal law convention um, on corruption of the Council of Europe. Um, uh, uh, you can see the offenses ranging from uh, different types of active bribery, um, active and passive in private and public sector, um, as well as um, uh, the offenses. Um, um, the offences um, um, of different types of bribery ranged according to the people who are perpetrating this uh, uh, this kind of offences, as well as trade in influence, money laundering of proceeds of from corruption offences and account offences. Let me use this opportunity to thank our technician Azar for excellent job in for all his assistance and kindness in helping me to actually performing this broadcast. Thank you very much. And um, I continue. Now we're looking at the, um, uh, I hope it's on your screen, at the domestic legislation. We're looking at our penal code year 2000, it was the year when it was adopted. Um, the corruption offenses are widely spread among the different uh, parts of this, uh, a penal code and Azerbaijan is following this uh, Romano-Germanic uh, legal tradition in codifying its legislation. So uh, uh, only the provisions of the penal code of the country can be applied in order to prosecute people, as, of course, and to uh, bring them to criminal liability. However, there's a specific chapter 30, uh, which is called offenses of corruption and other offenses against interest of service and you can see the here the articles the sections of this penal code are from 308 to 314 uh, these are uh, the um, uh, it encompasses this chapter encompasses the um, um, such offences as abuse of power, diversion of public funds, uh, breaking of public procurement rules, excessive power, taking on powers of official, active bribery, passive bribery, trade and influence, official fraud and negligence. Of course, I'm using a much more simplified terminology in order to make it understandable because, for example, the names of section 308 and uh, uh, 3081 and 3082, they're much more um, complicated in their, in their title, just uh, in accordance with the um, Azerbaijani legal tradition. But I just um, convey to you the, uh, in this short message, the essence of this uh, section. So, um, as I told you, I'm not going to read out all these uh, sections one by one and uh, explain to you the, um, the essence, the conditions and terms of these uh, sections of the penal code. Neither uh, am I going to do the same with the articles in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. I'm going to speak to you in broader terms about 
key concepts and definitions uh, which matter in order to understand the uh, the approach of the UN legislators and uh, UN experts and the Azerbaijani legislators in um, incriminating corruption in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, we'll speak about, first of all, the concept of officials. Uh, and this official, this concept comprises public officials, foreign public officials, uh, officials of international public organizations, as it mentioned in UNCAC, but uh, the European Convention goes further. And um, it also actually encompassed by UNCAC, but it's specifically mentioned in the European Convention, um, which mentions member of international parliamentary assemblies, judges and officials of international courts, um, also, um, we speak about the international jurors, which is um, contained in the protocol to the European Convention Against Corruption, this criminal law convention on corruption. And finally, uh, these private sector officials. Of course, we're going afterwards to speak about other concepts which are also of great importance, but we'll start with the concept of official in order to explain who can actually perpetrate the offences related to corruption or otherwise called corruption offences. So when we speak about um, public official, uh, according to international standards, um, the convention defined this concept through the office occupied by the people, the actual officials, I'm um, saying that I mean the office of the legislative branch, executive branch, or judicial branch, or any other kind of administrative position. Um, the convention also defines this concept through the um, through the uh, description of the mode of occupation. What it, what is meant by that is it doesn't matter whether official is appointed or elected doesn't matter how he occupies that position. So going back to the, on my previous note that um, um, uh, the legislators and experts are trying to take a wider, cons wider approach, uh, the uh, inclusive approach, they are trying to define this concept in such a way to comprise all the officials. It also doesn't matter um, um, what kind of term is uh, for what kind of for how long the term of the office uh, the the public official is occupying his position so it doesn't matter whether it's a permanent position or temporary position as long as this uh, position is uh, the person on this position is in charge of administering public functions is considered public official um, and as i mentioned to you earlier uh, earlier, the temporary, when we say temporary, we mean that it's position which is renewable. The people who are elected for the position uh, for certain terms and then they can be elected and re-elected, such as members of parliament. Also, the uh, UNCAC defines it according to the financial arrangement. It really doesn't matter what kind of uh, remuneration or compensation the public official is getting. Uh, it could be paid or indeed unpaid. It can be paid symbolically. We all know these um, famous cases of former New York mayors who were uh, foregoing their uh, official compensation and having the symbolical salaries of one dollar per year, or I don't remember, maybe per month. Um, so, um, this um, is important to include this concept, this dimension in the definition of public official because uh, there are certain types of positions for which public officials don't get compensation, but they are participating in um, passing rather crucial decisions, crucial decisions which are important and have different, like serious implications for the administration of state and even at all administration of institution or enterprise. 
uh, which is controlled by the state. They can be an example of that could be a kind of uh, board which is administering a board of supervisors where people are not getting salaries but still they can participate in a very important and crucial decision making process and therefore uh, not having them encompassed by these provisions would mean to let them uh, avoid and escape criminal liability. It's also important at this stage to mention that hierarchy doesn't matter as well. You can see it under the fifth uh, point. Uh, people of any kind of, uh, who occupy different position in, of different hierarchy, they shall be subject to criminal liability and therefore they have to be encompassed by the provision of public official. Also, it's important to say that um, the UNCAC, it defines this concept of public official uh, according to the nature of the function implemented by, by the person. So it doesn't matter really um, uh, what kind of um, institutional arrangement is made, what is the name of the institution, what kind of organizational form it takes on, it really matters that uh, that arrangement where the uh, public official is placed. It's in charge of uh, it's in charge of public function. It could be a public agency or public enterprise. Now, uh, or it just can be a person who is in charge of public service. As so, it doesn't really matter um how the uh, this matter is regulated in national legislation each country has its own tradition its own tradition in public governance and uh, regulation um so um uh, the uh, countries can choose different type of uh, terminology but all these institutions shall be encompassed the final point in this uh, in this um issue is that countries could take on additional measures to define the concept of um, public official so for the purpose of uh, application of uh, the provision of ANCAC uh, these domestic uh, regulations can be taken into account and this provision is actually crucial in the um, course of international cooperation so if one country looks at the incoming mutual legal assistance request and see that the person described there doesn't fully or actually match the concept of um, public official in his country or her country, but then according to UNCAC, he should uh, satisfy himself about this requirement of public official if he finds out that the person in whose regard this MLA request was submitted, that he's actually cons considered a public official according to the legislation of the uh, requesting country. And by saying requesting, I mean the country which actually submits the mutual legal assistance request. Um, so, um, so much about the um, definition of um, of the public official uh, according to the international standards. Now we'll look at the domestic situation, how this is done in our penal code, in our legislation. Um, in our country, it's regulated in note to section 308. Early on, you saw that this is section for the abuse of office, but it has a, a special provision after the um, text of the section, which is called note. And this note has equally the same um, effect as other parts of legislation. So according to this note, uh, the term of public official is defined. Um, again, if we look at our legislation, at the legislation of Azerbaijan, you can see that the legislator is using uh, the type of legislation that regulates the office. So by saying that, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter um, uh, what kind of legislation is uh, used in order to define uh, the uh, public function of a person. 
uh, such as constitution or legislation, we know that some position are positions, public positions, are described in the constitution, like the head, like the head of state or the president of the Supreme Court, and other positions are um, described only in legislation. The legislator also refers to the um, type of um, mode of occupation. Again, it's not important whether the person is selected or appointed. So here we can see similarity and echoing in of the United Nations Convention approach. Also, we can see that um, Azerbaijani legal tradition is reflected in this um, in this um, definition. Um, as the United Nations Convention uh, provides a room for this type of approach. So, um, according to Azerbaijani legislation, legal tradition, we also included here the Office of Representation. So, um, there could be special powers delegating authority to a public official uh, by virtue of which the person can be considered public official for the purpose of the penal code also uh, this is um, appropriate to all branches of power as we can see the judicial legislative and executive um in azerbaijan there is also a different concept of um, self-administration um, the municipal power which is considered as not belonging to any of these three branches of power so this um this dimension is also covered under the head of representation. There are also um, a military personnel which does not fall into these, uh, into these uh, categories. Therefore, it's, it, it's mentioned in its own merit, in its own position. Um, also, um, the penal code, uh, it mentions the position of uh, civil service, different positions in civil service. So entire civil service include its specific types, such as we know that there are different specific types of civil service, like service in the prosecution service, service in the uh, Ministry of Emergency or justice bodies, etc. So all of these are covered under this uh, uh, specific provisions on civil service. Um, important issue here is that also political candidates are covered. They are also um, considered public officials. Um, so um, hence they can be considered as people who are, who are capable of committing corruption offenses, um, like MP uh, candidates for the position of MPs or candidates for judicial positions. And also, the legislator took into account uh, various positions, um, various positions in terms of different um, institutional arrangements. Um, what I mean by that, um, the legislator in Azerbaijan took a very peculiar approach uh, when he describes the enterprises and institutions that belong to state or the institutions which are administered by state as the state controls uh, the substantial part of the shares of, of these institutions. And in dealing with this type of um, positions, uh, this note to section 308 of the penal code, it refers to different types of functions which can be uh, implemented by people, by public officials, these are economic, managerial, and administrative functions, as well as directors and employees. What does it mean in practice? In practice, um, I can say that almost all people employed by state institutions can actually be uh, members of the, of, uh, can be considered public officials. And, if they're not employees, but they are actually implementing these additional functions as well, they can also be considered public officials, and hence they can be prosecuted and adjudicated. Which I mean, um, by that I mean that they can be convicted of corruption offences. Um, when we speak about 
Uh, before we actually go to the foreign public officials, I would like to refer to two important decisions of the um, um, of the plenary session of the Supreme Court, as well as plenary session of the Constitutional Court, which um, describe this um, stance of Azerbaijani legislation on public officials. Um, and I should say that, in a sense, it's a kind of um, decision which provides a good description of the national and international regulations in this field. Um, and it, it sheds some light on the um, on the definition of public officials, whether it covers certain categories or not, but it still um, didn't provide uh, answers to certain answers uh, to certain questions, such as uh, the category of teachers and doctors. While it's clear to some degree uh, with one of them, it's not clear whether the other category is fully encompassed. The only criteria which is used by the Constitutional Court in its famous decision is that, again, uh, only the people um, from among the, these two categories who are actually discharging some sort of uh, directorial, these managerial or administrative or economic function, they can be um, considered as public officials. Now we're switching on the next concept of foreign public official. It's crucial, it's important concept, which is um, underlying the uh, global international approach of fighting against corruption in all countries and not only specifically in one country. Uh, the uncut provision in courage to um, incriminate these provisions, to include this into the national legislations. Again, if we look at the definition of the foreign public official, we could see the dimensions here are according to the office, whether the person is occupying, is um, administering um, um, the legislative, executive, administrative or judicial office in a foreign country, as well as uh, the international standards refer to the mode of occupation, such as the um, appointment or election, and uh, naturally the definition of um, definition of public official in a foreign country. So that really matters uh, if the person is uh, defined as public official in his own country. Um, when we look at the domestic legislation, um, at the domestic legislation, again, it's all covered in note to section 308 of the Penal Code. Um, there, we can see that uh, the legislator mentions the uh, public officials of uh, foreign uh, state institutions and bodies, as well as um, members of the elected uh, institution in foreign country. <coughs> so foreign public officials and elected officials. The next category which I'm going to speak about is the international standards related to international public officials. In simple terms, these are people who are working in international organizations. Of course, at the time when convention was, the United Nations Convention was adopted, um, the international community, the people in the international community didn't appreciate enough the significance of this concept. But um, right now, after all these scandals in international institutions, of uh, the famous cases of uh, bribery, allegations of bribery in sport events and other uh, type of arrangements, they signify the underlying the significance of uh, actually encompassing the concept of international public official. Um, we are approaching the 45th minute, uh, 45th minute of our lecture. Naturally, if we didn't have it online, if we hadn't ha have it online, had it online, we would uh, stop here. But I don't want to waste your time. I appreciate all your patience for being online on this uh, day. Today's uh, today actually a Sunday.
and it's not a working day. I appreciate your patience and we will continue our lecture. Um, in the domestic legis in the international in international standards in this field, they are quite broad, absolutely broad. They cover international civil servants. I mean servants of people who are working, any person who is working or is authorized um, by um, an international organization to act on its behalf. And examples of these international organizations, of course, these are World Bank, UEFA, FIFA, Council of Europe, and other institutions. Um, domestically, domestically, these kind of provisions, they are regulated by, uh, again, Section 308, a note to the Section 308 of the Penal Code 2000, um, our legislation is also covering this, um, this category uh, by mentioning the uh, officials of international organizations as well as its other employees. Uh, the legislation even goes further and mentions the uh, representatives of the international, international parliamentary assemblies, um, judges uh, and other persons employed by the international judiciary authorities um, as well as quite interestingly uh, foreign and international arbiters arbiters um, which are people who are um, administering this arbitration function um, now we're coming to the fourth final uh, concept of official which is private sector official um, they're not specifically um, specifically mentioned uh, as a uh, in the terminology at the beginning of the international uh, of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. They are mentioned in the uh, articles criminalizing uh, bribery in private sector <coughs> in both um, United Nations Convention and Council of Europe Convention. Um, it is stated as a person who directs or works in any capacity for a private uh, se sector entity. Uh, if we look at our legislation, the legislation of Azerbaijan, you can see that this uh, actually rather broad uh, inclusive legislation is similarly reflected in our legislation. It covers directors, employees, all kind of employees as well as people who um, actually implement these different economic, managerial and administrative uh, functions. Um, before I proceed to uh, other, other um, concepts, other concepts which are important in order to understand and navigate in these uh, provisions on incrimination of corruption in international instruments, as well as um, national legislation, domestic legislation of Azerbaijan, I would like to draw your attention to a very specific provision of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. It reads out that in Article 28, that knowledge, intent or purpose required as an element of an offence established in accordance with this convention may be inferred from objective factual circumstances. It is actually a very important issue, very important issue and a very important benchmark. It's a very important benchmark that we need to take into account. It will act as a framework for our actually previous and subsequent discussion the national system, the national law enforcement system, national legislative system, specifically law enforcement and judiciary system, it has to be prepared to handle these corruption issues in the way that is described in this convention, in this article of this convention. If we try to deal with corruption behavior according to the um, intentions or purposes, declared by perpetrators, there'll be no way that we'll be able to implement the provisions and exert a fight against corruption 
in at the necessary uh, corresponding and adequate level. We have to be prepared to judge on the consequences on the out, outer manifestation of corruption behavior in order to deduce the knowledge, intent or purpose of this activity. Otherwise, it would be impossible to operate with the, with the following context because um, if we don't, if we try to uh, extract this knowledge, intent and purpose from the actual perpetrators, from their interviews, um, from their depositions, it will not be possible to find out their real um, intention. Um, what I mean by that is these key concepts of offer, promise, acceptance of offer and promise and solicitation. Um, when we speak about uh, corruption, usually uh, most of people, most of bystanders, uh, standards, they understand by this um, uh, by this uh, offence primarily uh, the offence of bribery. And when we speak about bribery, usually people think of the type of attitude and behaviour when public official is given something and in return to getting something of uh, of um, something precious something which is something of value the public officials they are um, doing or not doing something um, this concept of simple corruption was taken further by the united nations convention and the provisions reflected the mirroring provisions of our legislation um, the United Nations Convention, it um, requires criminalization of these concepts of offer and promise, as well as acceptance of this offer and promise and solicitation. Why is it important? Why is it important? And why does uh, the Convention um, require so? The thing is, uh, these concepts, although they were taken on by uh, many countries, uh, in the recent recent times, maybe decades, maybe 10 years or 20 years ago, these concepts actually uh, started to operate in some countries as um, long ago as a century ago. Um, the legislation of some countries criminalized often promise of bribe uh, at the beginning of 20th century. And there are many, quite actually, quite a few countries like that. Um, why is it important to criminalize this, uh, these concepts? The thing is, um, in our previous legislation, before we brought in line um, uh, the legislation with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and Council of Europe's Convention Against Corruption, Often promise of a bribe as well as other types of this behavior, they were criminalized, but not necessarily in an adequate manner. That means that all these actions would be considered as uh, incurred crimes, as a preparation for the crime, or as actually not a preparation, but as an attempt of committing this type of crime, attempt of uh, bribing public official or attempt of uh, taking bribe. Uh, the purpose beyond the criminalization of these concepts is that um, the uh, legislator, and when I say legislator, I mean first of all the legislator at the international level, the people who drafted in uh, UNCAC and Council of Europe Convention, as well as legislated in Azerbaijan, they were willing to uh, stress the public danger of uh, bribery. So, not only giving of, of uh, some objects of value, but actual offering or promising already would constitute a danger to the normal course of public administration. It's very important to understand that. The, the main idea behind this is that all the state institutions, all public institutions, I mean, any normal state, it's supposed to operate in an environment which is free from corruption, 
public officials are supposed to administer their functions in a in a correct manner in a uh, according to the rules in line with the legal traditions of that state that means without any sort of additional incentive so any additional incentive which is brought uh, into the agenda, into the discussion with public official, it already already um, actually um, um, it already uh, distorts the normal course of public administration. Therefore, even the very fact of a simple offering or promising a bribe to a public official or acceptance of a promise or offer or solicitation of a bribe by a public official, it already constitutes um, constitutes um, danger. And that's why it shall be criminalized. Uh, sometime earlier, I mentioned to you that in order to uh, deduce the intent knowledge of the behavior, the objective circumstances must be taken into account. If we don't actually take into account the objective circumstances, it would be rather difficult to understand and even to also to apply these concepts. Another reason why the offer on these concepts were included in the definition in, as a key concept in criminalization of corruption is that um, the modern life is rather complicated and it's not the same as years ago. And the different type of financial vehicles, financial mechanisms, uh, which can be considered as a potential incentives for uh, public officials in, uh, in terms of bribery. That means that um, public officials may not always go for money or something tangible, something in their hands immediately. They might actually um, be willing to engage in illegal activities in exchange for simple promise, a uh, simple offer of something which they will take possession of in the future. And um, this is also very important to understand that in the, at the time when the public officials are facing um, greater uh, possibility of criminal prosecution, um, which is actually different in the, from country to country, they are seeking additional methods additional methods of taking bribes so an option of getting a, a bag of cash is not always available and they will have to trust uh, to trust and uh, the people who are trying to bribe them that certain type of incentives will be provided in the future at this point i actually want to mention different a, an interesting theory um, which i heard from a very respected professor um, uh, uh, professor Land, Land, landorf um, uh, who is a renowned expert in the field of fight against corruption who was considering who is actually considering uh, corruption as a kind of transaction as a kind of transaction um, between perpetrator and um, and the person from outside I mean, the people, pe person who wants to bribe a public official and public official on the other side. So he would uh, consider that anything that is operating, anything that is effective in uh, actually breaking this transaction, it counts for anti-corruption measure in a good sense that countries shall take additional measures in order to consider this uh, corruption um, deal as a transaction. and bring in all types of um, um, tools and measures which are available in order to break this agreement. So, so much so for this uh, concept of uh, offer, promise, acceptance of offer and promise and solicitation. Um, the next concepts uh, which are of great importance are the concepts of uh, third party beneficiaries. Or as you can see on the uh, screen, third party benefit. It again, this concept emanates from the evolution of the financial and economic system 
um, systems in our lives, not always uh, in order to disguise the, uh, their corruption, their corrupt behavior, public officials may resort to different type of, uh, different type of uh, actions. Um, um, a typical way to, 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 um, to hide the corruption uh, behavior would be not to get uh, the benefit um, for himself, but to get benefit uh, for the, under the name of a third, par third party, different person or entity. Uh, an example of that would be when um, actually uh, property or money, um, property is transferred or uh, money is um, transferred from a uh, bank account of a person, bribing person, to the account of, uh, to, to another bank account of which uh, beneficiary is this public official. Or indeed, that's, that can be not only uh, the case of uh, uh, being a beneficial owner of a bank account, it could be a relative or a friend of public official whom he trusts. Um, so uh, after engaging in this corrupt behavior and doing or foregoing to do something, after some time, the public official can take control and use and benefit from funds which were transferred to the third party. This concept is also, also important in terms of uh, the so-called um, uh, corruption in uh, political arrangements. When the uh, public officials, members of certain political affiliations, parties, they are abusing their office in order to bring some benefit to their parties and affiliations. They are doing something in exchange for people uh, providing some kind of, uh, some in-kind or money benefits uh, to their parties. Also, it's important to mention here this concept of, um, the concept of um, uh, related to modus operandi, the direct or indirect uh, accepting of bribe. Um, in our previously, in our legislation, our penal code, we had a separate provision on uh, on the um, participating in uh, the uh, bribery. Um, this also um, has its legal implications. We know that uh, the people who are actually um, uh, doing this. Um, they, they can get away with a lesser punishment. I'm not going to mention these provisions right now at this today's lecture, but um, I will mention it in our subsequent lectures. But um, this modus operandi uh, of indirect involvement in bribery, it carries similar public dangers. Therefore, the legislator also tried to uh, encompass this type of behavior and uh, maintain that uh, whether the involvement in this bribery transaction is direct or indirect, it carries this similar type of um, public danger and naturally the um, publicly dangerous consequences. Um, Another important concept is the concept of undue benefit. Undue benefit, it's a uh, concept which is new for our legislation and it, it's also new, it has been new for the legislation and legal traditions of many countries and uh, its origination and development is also linked to the general socio-economic development and the development of financial institutions and the development of, of uh, our day-to-day -day life. Um, as I said, if previously the bribery was considered typically as someone bringing a bag of cash, a case of cash, and in exchange of this cash, public official would do something, uh, it actually changed with time. So it could be different types of uh, incentives provided to public, public officials. It can be um, financial resources like money. It can be as well as different type of interests, 
it can be tangible and intangible property, corporate and incorporate property, something we can touch and something that we cannot touch. It could be, for example, uh, legal documents uh, which reflect the legal title to property. Um, it can be anything, indeed, uh, anything which can be uh, of which can be uh, calculated in terms of value and anything that cannot be actually calculated in terms of value. Um, of course, it depends on the level of the openness of legal system, openness of the people who are operating in the legal system, specifically the investigators, police officers, prosecutors and judges, what they would understand under this undue benefit. And I will also mention this at the end of our lecture. But it can really be anything. And this concept is a very dynamic concept. It develops with the course of time. So, uh, for example, it could be um, like an appointment to a public position. So public official would take a bribe, uh, will do something, will do something, uh, engage himself in, in, a, in a kind of behavior exercise or forgo to take an action in exchange for, let's say, um, his nephew taking position in, uh, in, in the board, for example, some executive board of a private institution. Of course, we cannot measure in value what, uh, how much does it worth. One can tell that it depends on the salary, but it's not always the case. I mean, the salary which his nephew is going to take as the member of that executive board. Another famous example, which is actually taken on very seriously nowadays, is the undue benefit of sexual favors, which uh, is solicited uh, or indeed offered and promised and given by the, um, by the perpetrators. And it's, it forms the deal between um, it's actually the subject of the deal between the people, the person, and the public official. In UN current UN terminology, it's uh, called uh, sextortion. As you know, this is the um, this is the uh, it's made of combination of two terms of sex and extortion, whereby the public official is uh, requiring this type of uh, services. Um, I think that um, the state uh, and also our states, all the states in the world, they shall step up their efforts in raising awareness about this dangerous. Um, and um, finally, the concept, uh, so far for enough, the concept of undue benefit. And I will uh, mention also the concept of property, um, property which is uh, actual, which is used in the definition of uh, such type of offences, embezzlement. It also has to cover different types of property, whether it's um, top property of any value, including the legal documents of titles to 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 any type of uh, uh, property itself. Um, let me now mention about the state of affairs in our national legislation specifically. Um, all this concept, most of this concept, uh, they actually uh, were introduced in two steps. In two steps, and these steps are marked by the adoption of these acts, which you can see in your on your screen. This is Penal Law Amendment Act of 2006 and Penal Law Amendment Act of 2011. These two um, laws, these two acts, they introduced a wide range of um, amendments to the Penal Code provisions, including uh, the concepts of, um, uh, the concept of uh, uh, offer and promise, uh, third party benefit, and uh, this undue advantage, so it took the legislators in Azerbaijan uh, two steps actually to bring it in conformity. Let me uh, mention that um, Azerbaijan has already undergone um, uh, evaluations uh, for the incrimination and, or otherwise 
speaking otherwise, criminalization of corruption uh, under three uh, different international mechanisms, including the mechanism of United Nation, of Council of Europe, and OECD's anti-corruption network. And overall, the country, these um, evaluation mechanisms, they considered that um, um, our legislation uh, for the most part of it is in line with the requirements with the requirements of incrimination set by uh, criminal law convention on corruption of the council of europe and the uh, uh, provisions on criminalization in the united nations convention against corruption there are of course uh, some sort of uh, deficiencies in the legislation uh, but uh, they are not um, wide in range for the most part, the country is compliant. As an example of shortcoming, um, I can mention to you <coughs> uh, the um, provision on the uh, automatic um, automatic uh, relief from uh, criminal prosecution for people who are actually paying bribes, but then informing uh, the competent institutions about this uh, this. Um, instance but uh, this will be subject of our subsequent lecture when i will speak specifically uh, about uh, this um, these norms um, in our next lecture we're going to speak about um, um, we're going to speak about these uh, specific provisions of um, uh, uh, criminalization of uh, corruption in the public sector of um, Azerbaijan, including section of 308 uh, on abuse of power, active bribery, and the passive bribery. Um, I'm looking at the timer now. It has been 71 minutes. Um, I appreciate that you are watching this video, this lecture uh, on Sunday. I would like to express my gratitude to you for this um, for your, um, for your effort, for your zeal of study. And I know how difficult it is to concentrate on these online lectures. Uh, I must admit that for me, it's a, it's a kind of new experience. This is my only my third lecture online. Two previous were not live, but they were only, I just only uploaded them after I recorded them. And I appreciate uh, the um, recommendations and um, recommendations and advices of my students who help me in improving the quality of these lectures. So at this point, I'm planning to stop this uh, lecture five on of the uh, incrimination of uh, public sector corruption in Azerbaijan. I just I would like to finish uh, my. Um, uh, my uh, lecture with this um, with this message, which I started my lecture with: uh, stay at home, uh, be optimistic, and just don't waste your time, guys. Nice summer time is coming, so um, you don't need to uh, spend more of your precious time, which you can spend for other most pleasant activities, uh, sitting with your books. You can listen to the lectures, you can study now in order to be prepared to enjoy your summer. And I wish that these different times of coronavirus and this pandemic are passing over quite soon. Thank you for your attention.